Good day, everyone. I'm going to discuss for this session, business combination, second part. So before viewing this or continuing to this one, make sure that you have watched and played and viewed the first part of business combinations. Now, you can see on the picture the good illustration of why businesses would combine. We want more benefits, the synergistic benefits. So we said that the benefits that would be obtained would be the sum of the components of the businesses plus one. So greater than the sum of the parts or components of a business combination. Now let us go into the discussions. As what we've said, allow me to review this part. We have two major types of acquisition. We have acquisition of net assets and the acquisition of stocks. In acquisition of net assets, we actually acquire a company or companies, but for simplicity of illustration, we say that we acquire a company and then that company that acquired is basically dissolved. So the acquirer remains to exist while the acquiry again ceases to exist. So we have to know that the computation of goodwill or gain and acquisition if negative result but that is not a negative amount as what we've said it should be presented as gain on acquisition so to basically compute that we have to compute first the fair value of net identifiable assets to do that simply use whatever fair value of the assets including and recognized assets at fair value less any liabilities assumed also at fair values basically that's the fair value of net identifiable assets. So I repeat, fair value of assets less fair value of liabilities equals fair value of net identifiable assets. Now, for the computation of cases one and two, so you are done with fair value of net identifiable assets, and then the price paid or consideration given whether cash or non-cash, and stocks, for example, or liabilities like issuance of bonds. So we have to consider fair value always. So fair value of the consideration issued by the acquirer or parent in this stock acquisition, less the fair value of net identifiable assets of the acquired company or the acquiree. While all costs, whether direct or indirect, should be expensed immediately. That's the ruling under IFRS 3 business combinations revised. Then for share issuance costs, they are to be charged to or to be deducted from APIC, but now again share premium. So I may be using share premium and APIC or additional paid in capital interchangeably, but to more on the share premium. So we are going to pattern with IAS or IFRS terms. And then any excess shall be charged to expense. Now, the balance of APIC or share premium would be based on the original issuance of the shares issued. All right. So that's why you can see it here. So in this particular part, this is the issuance costs of stocks 30,000 and then the 50,000 is basically the professional fee so that is direct business combination costs okay so that's why it is to be expensed again whether direct or indirect should be expensed all right and on the second part that resulted to gain an acquisition. So this is to be presented as component of profit or loss or income statement of the statement of comprehensive income. While the stock issuance cost, you can see it here that 100,000 was initially at share premium or APIC, which was the balance of the original issuance or previous issuance. And the excess is at stock issuance costs or expenses which will be close to retained earnings later on all right so those are the items that we have tackled so far and then let's continue or go on so recording contingent consideration 
as said, contingent consideration basically is any particular additional costs of acquisition wherein it's going to depend on certain factors or certain situations. So in our example here, we can see that in addition to the stock issued, the acquirer agreed to pay an additional 200000 on January 1, 2014, if the average income for the two-year period of 2012 and 2013 exceeds 160000 My question, though, is when was the particular acquisition? So let us go back. This is the continuation case one. Okay, so it's June 30, 2013. And then the additional consideration is to be given in 2014. That is January 1. Yeah, January 1, 2014. So that is still within one year. So within the measurement period of one year given after the date of acquisition, wherein we can still incorporate or incorporate and it changes to our goodwill or gain on acquisition. Now, average income exceeds 160,000 per year. We did not give or we were not given the analysis here. It is because the estimated or expected value is already given. And actually, and fortunately for us guys, it is really possible in real life that we will be asked to compute it, the expected value. So in this particular case, that's 100,000 based on the 50% probability of achieving the target average outcome. So that's the 100,000. We do not multiply it by 50%. Why? Since the 100,000 is already the result after we incorporate the 50,000 probability. So I guess there is something that we should know, which is 200,000 times 50%. So basically that's going to be whatever was the consideration multiplied by the probability equals the expected value. So for those who are already done with quantitative techniques of business analysis, you know this one. And then supposedly it should have been analyzing are we able to achieve the target that is the average income of 2012 and 2013 exceeds 160,000? So if no given, for example, let's say probability, so we should know supposedly like how much really is the average income? So let's say for 2012, it's 200, 2013, that's 300. So 200 plus 300 is 500, and then divided by 2, 250,000. So in that case, we really exceeded the average income. And so we have to pay the additional consideration of 200,000. But then, of course, we need also to know the probability because we have to estimate it at the time of our acquisition. So by January 1, 2014. So this was the time that we actually have to pay, right? To pay or not to pay the contingent consideration. But by June 30, 2013, we are already estimating as to how much really is the value of this consideration. Okay, I hope that is clear. Then you have here the analysis and the goodwill. So for the analysis, we have here the stocks at market value and then the estimated value of contingent consideration less the fair value of net assets acquired from the company. So the resulting figure is the goodwill. All right. For the other items, you know this. Again, for professional fees, they are to be expensed immediately while the stock issuance cost should be reduced from additional paid-in capital or share premium. 
Now for the entries, so similarly for the previous examples, on the part of the acquirer, this is the acquirer, the acquirer receives the assets at fair value and assumes the liabilities at fair value. Any excess could be goodwill or gain on acquisition. Since this is goodwill where the acquisition cost exceeds the fair value of identifiable net assets of the acquiry, take note of the word identifiable. So this excludes pre-existing goodwill and take note of the word net assets, which means assets minus liabilities. So the excess would be goodwill or gain and acquisition. Gain and acquisition would be on the credit side. And we can also notice here the contingent consideration payable at fair value and the total value of the consideration given by the acquirer. So you have here common stock of par value and the share premium with the excess of par. All right. So that's number one. And the number two, okay, we know these things already. For changes, so what if there would be changes during and then beyond the measurement period or after the measurement period? If during the measurement period, so what we're going to do is simply adjust it to whatever computed amount either goodwill or gain on acquisition. So a while ago, that was goodwill, right? Here, that's goodwill. And so there was revision. The estimate was revised to 160,000. A while ago, that was 100,000. So meaning there is an additional amount for contingent consideration payable, that's 60,000. And so the goodwill should be debited at 60,000. So that's the first entry. Another one, what if we already went beyond or after the measurement period? So this is the continuation of this particular example here. Okay, so after the measurement period, it was really 200,000. So from 160, it moved further to 200,000. So there is a contingent consideration payable credit additional amount of 40,000. However, we can no longer charge it to goodwill or gain on acquisition goodwill in this particular case because that's beyond. Instead, it's going to be charged to profit or loss. And that's why we debited loss on contingent consideration payable. So that's the first item. And then This is the case if ever the contingent consideration is going to be cash or non-cash consideration. But if it is in relation to stocks, so other assets or cash would be again, that's going to be profit or loss. But if additional shares of stocks, so it's going to be an adjustment in between equity. So let's read. An agreement to issue additional stock upon the occurrence of future event is treated to be a change in the estimated value of the shares issued. So in that case, no liability is recorded at the acquisition date. The only entry made is at the date when additional shares are issued. All right. So that's why no entry for this one for this particular situation. And then, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. For this one, we have to go back here. So no entry, meaning we do not include contingent consideration payable here, even here. So we were correct a while ago that this wouldn't be around. This would also not be around. And then, our adjustment would be around when additional shares are issued to example here. But if example shares are already issued here, so there would be an entry. That's the point. So what is clear is that no entry at the acquisition and if there are any additional shares there on, they will be recorded as adjustments. All right, so I said the only entry made is at the date when additional shares are issued. Okay, so you have here 
agreement to issue 20,000 additional shares. And then there's also the target exceeded 160,000 average income. Then uh, there would be no change in the entry in case one to record the acquisition on June 30, 2013. Yeah. And then assuming that the contingent event occurs or there is an issuance of additional 20,000 shares. So this would be our entry. In fact, we just debited share premium or APIC and credit ordinary shares or share capital dash ordinary shares at 200,000. Oh, 20,000 times 10. Okay, that's 200,000 also debit. So this is just a typographical error. All right, so we can just see here that it's just a matter of movement of equity items. They're both equity items. So this is just true if, again, the contingent consideration relates to stocks or shares of corporation. Okay, now, recording changes in value during measurement period. So as what I've said, the values for example, if there are any estimated amounts, would be provisional. So the word is provisional. Why is that? The amounts could still change within the measurement period. And that's why we are even saying again that if ever the resulting figure is gain and acquisition, then there is really a rebuttable presumption that we have to go over with all items because why is it that you are acquiring a business? because we think of synergistic benefits, therefore goodwill, meaning we have to pay and we are willing to pay a premium. The premium is the goodwill on top of the fair value of identifiable net assets. But then there would be really instances that we gain on the acquisition of the acquiry. So meaning we purchased the acquiry at a bargain. So meaning we were able to get it at a lower amount, and that's the reason that there is gain in acquisition. Okay, let's read. Changes in value caused by events that occur after the acquisition date are not a part of this adjustment. They would be adjusted to income in the period they occur. All right. The values recorded on the acquisition date are considered provisional. Then the measurement period ends when the improved information is available or is it obvious that no better information is available? In no case can the measurement period exceed one year from the acquisition date. All right, so that's what I've said that it's still, it's going to be within one year from the date of acquisition or when control has been established. So going back to the same company, J&J &J Company, that's the acquired company. So the value of the building is considered provisional. Then the 2013 financial year will include the statement of comprehensive income accounts for the acquired J&J &J Company starting as of the acquisition date, June 30. The values assigned to buildings and resulting adjustments to income for 2013 and projected for 2014 are as follows. So here is the provisional value, 900,000. And then the amount that was recorded for the PPE value is 660,000. Is there a residual value? I guess so. There is a residual value because when we computed for the particular depreciation, that is, let's check, 240,000 divided by 20 years. Okay, so probably the point here is that look at the cost. So 660,000, this was the amount, 240,000 for the depreciation, which is divided over 20 years, and then that's 12,000 per year. So 
the 240,000 probably here is the accumulated depreciation for 20 years for us to be able to get the depreciation expense per year, that's 12,000. Divided by 12, that's 1,000 a month. And we can also do our analysis backwards here, although this is beyond our course, but then if this is like the intermediate financial accounting and reporting part two, so we can also trace that hmm, if this is like 12,000 per year, so that's going to be 72, right? So, uh, no, 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 72,000 for six months, yeah. But then 144,000 for the one year, all right? So that's going to be that case. The truth of the matter here is that the depreciation method is shown at straight line, and this would involve like the accumulated depreciation and depreciation expense. Anyway, so I mentioned a lot already just to give you the background, but the point here of the matter is that the provisional value, 900,000, is the estimated value of the building. It is said here that the amount is provisional in nature. So this follows that the amount of the building can change. And this can also be true for other assets, most especially if they're long term and changes could happen in the long run or long term. And so take note that the acquisition date was June 30, 2013. And the changes of the values can happen within one year. So if that is June 30, 2013, it's going to be like going to end by minus one day. So June 29, 2014. So changes can happen. So example here, 900,000 provisional value projected. And then the residual value of 660,000. That's quite big. So we can just compute that. 900 minus 660. That's 240,000. You call that the depreciable cost. If you can recall with intermediate financial accounting and reporting part two so 240,000 that is the depreciable cost divided by 20 years that's the useful life of the building which means that it's 12,000 per year then 1,000 per month since the asset has been existing already for six months of course, that's going to be like prior years also in consideration, but just for the year 2013, like from January 1, 2013, up to the date of acquisition, June 30, 2013, that's six months of 6,000. And then the projected amount for 2014 then is 12,000 if the provisional value continues to be at 900,000. However, we notice here that in the early 2014, that's January, let's say 2014, it really increased its value to 950,000, right? And that's why our first entry here is that we have to adjust the further increase in value. If we recorded at 900,000 for the building, although if it's going to be really different also, so we have to make another adjusting entry for this one prior to 50,000. Anyway, the point here is that you can notice that it is debited to the building which is the asset or if it is for example another asset we have to debit it or if it is a liability so we have to credit it and credit to goodwill so in this particular case why is it a credit to goodwill if we can just recall the formula of computing goodwill is acquisition cost less fair value of identifiable net assets of the acquiry so when assets would increase, which is debit building, meaning the subtrahend, which is the fair value of identifiable net assets of the acquiry, would increase, therefore decreasing goodwill. So decreasing goodwill, decreasing difference because of the increased minus. So the more minuses, then the lesser the difference or the result. Okay, that's mathematical. And then going back, so 950,000 less 590,000 residual value. That's really big for a residual value. But anyway, let's just follow the problem. 
twenty sixty thousand depreciable cost divided by still twenty years. That's eighteen thousand per year and one five per month. For the six months from January 1, 2013 to June 30, 2013, there's 9,000. And then in 2014, that's going to be at 18,000 pesos. And so to continue, if it was a gain on acquisition, then we are going to charge it or credit it to gain on acquisition. And then for gain on acquisition, since this was in 2013 and the books are to be closed at the end of 2013 and so for 2014 we have to adjust the gain to retained earnings that's the continuation or explanation of this entry which we have already discussed in changes in measurement period but here this is like changes in value during the measurement period of the provisional amounts prior one was on the contingent consideration then another entry would be in 2014 we have to adjust the depreciation retroactively so we have to add 3000 since we already record the depreciation in 2014 at 18000 we have to adjust the 2013 so that's 6000 and then 9000 the revised amount so 9,000 minus 6,000 is 3,000 here, right? That's 3,000. So what period is applicable? It's not from January 1 to June 30, 2013, but it's from July 1, 2013 to December 31, 2013, wherein we have to incorporate really the revised value of the depreciation expense which is at nine thousand and then this is six thousand so three thousand difference all right especially that this estimate was available in 2014 so we have already recorded the depreciation for july 1 2013 to december 31 2013 at six thousand pesos in 2013 prior to july 1 meaning that was January 1, 2013 to June 30, 2013, that's going to be as is. We do not change that anymore because that is before the acquisition. You have to change only the values that are provisional after acquisition that is within the measurement period of one year. Okay, hopefully that is clear. Then that's it for the part of the acquirer. What about on the part of the acquiree? Here, these are the entries. So if this is acquisition of net assets, the acquiree will cease to exist. Therefore, we have to close all accounts in the books of the acquiree. Here we can notice we close the liabilities at debit. We credited assets to close them. So simply to close assets and liabilities is to put them on the opposite sides, credit and debit respectively. Then we debit investment in acquire incorporated. So the existing shareholders of the acquiree would become shareholders now of the acquirer because the acquiree would cease to exist. So meaning they have now investments in acquirer. And the difference is gain on sale of business, meaning these are the steps for liquidation. And on the part of the acquirer, so distribution of acquirer incorporated shares received to its shareholders and the liquidation of J and J companies. So if acquirer acquires the acquiree. So J and J company, it's really going to be this thing. This is really the greatest possibility that the shareholders of the acquirer would receive the shares from the acquiree. So it's like the second thing that the acquiree shareholders would really become part of the acquirer. Okay, since the point here is that we are acquiring the net assets. So basically, 
we acquired also the shares of the acquired company, right? I think that's logical because what's the point of the acquiring company of acquiring the acquiry if the existing shareholders and the outgoing shareholders of the acquiry would still be there in the acquirer unless that's part of the agreement. Anyway, so normally, that's why I said normally speaking, acquirer shareholders would receive the shares of the acquired company or acquiring. To continue, so we have here the particular equity of the, then the equity shares of the acquiree will be closed. So you have here from common stock down to retained earnings. We can basically see them on J and J company here. The equity accounts, 50,000 to 925,000 retained earnings. The new term or IAS term is accumulated profits and losses for the retained earnings. Okay, and then gain and sale of business, basically that's gain, will be closed for the end of the accounting period or at the end of the accounting period to retain earnings. But anyway, this is already the liquidation, so it doesn't matter. And it would equate to the investment in acquirer incorporated value. So basically, this is the equity consideration given by the acquirer. And these are the equity items plus the gain. If there is goodwill, probably it's going to be on the other side or the same side as well, depending on the situation. All right. After that, what particular financial statements that the acquirer should prepare? So the statement of financial position of the acquirer incorporated after the combination, and this is the balance sheet, would include all the assets and liabilities of the J&J &J company at fair values because we acquired the fair values of the identifiable net assets of the acquiry. But this includes goodwill, if there is any, and gain on acquisition is closed later on to retain earnings. Whereas for the statement of comprehensive income, which is the two-part composed of profit or loss or income statement, and the comprehensive income, second part, which is other comprehensive income or OCI, should be part of this one. But it will only be after the date of acquisition only. So meaning whatever income prior to the date of acquisition will be disregarded, just like our discussion a while ago involving changes of provisional values, wherein the depreciation of the building prior to the acquisition will not be changed only within the measurement period or within the acquisition period, so that the resulting income figure or loss figure would be incorporating the changes within the acquisition period. So remember, income or profit or loss would only happen when there is performance out of the operations of the business. Okay, so that statement of comprehensive income. Then, okay, that's the part wherein that's the acquisition of net assets example to contingent consideration. So another one would be the acquisition of stocks. But then let's check. So for this particular part here, anyway, this is going to be short though. Acquisition of stocks, then impairment and disclosure. So we are almost at the end of part two of business combinations. For acquisition of stocks, as we've said, the acquired company or the subsidiary as we call it, continues to exist. Then the acquiring company or the acquiry is the, uh, sorry, acquirer. What am I saying? So acquiring company or the acquirer would be transferring or giving consideration to the acquiry or subsidiary in order to achieve control of 50 plus 1% of the shares of the acquiry. And then in this situation, both 
companies continue to exist. So they are not dissolved and liquidated whatsoever. But then at the end of the accounting period, the two entities would, of course, be consolidated. It is the parent that would initiate the consolidated financial statement reports. So just to be able to know the statement of financial position and the, of course, comprehensive income, including the performance of the two entities as a whole. All right. So we have here the P company that acquires S company out of 10,000 issued and outstanding shares of the acquiry or subsidiary, which is S company for 2 million pesos cash. So in other words, the consideration transferred is cash. Although it's possible, it's going to be equity to equity. So the parent issues shares to acquire the shares of the subsidiary. But in this case, it is simple. So we are okay with it because it's really cash. All right. Professional fees are paid. So this is to be expensed immediately or are paid. So are to be expensed immediately and close to retained earnings later on. All right. Of course, we have known that expenses are close to income and expense summary again, and then close to accumulated profits and losses, formerly known as retained earnings. So we are just going to mention anyway the old terms since the problems will be mentioning them. And it's going to be losses on our ends if we do not know the old terms, only to find out that they are easy to understand. All right, so first is acquisition. If you can notice here, the credit is cash because the transferred consideration is cash and we debited investment in subsidiary S company. In this case, for acquisition of stocks, we do not debit the assets at fair value. We do not credit the liabilities at fair value and recognizing any goodwill or gain on acquisition. Instead, we are just going to debit the subsidiary investment account and credit whatever is the consideration. If this is like acquisition of stocks through stocks of the parent company, so the credit would be the shares, let's say ordinary shares at par value and credit the share premium and excess of par. But again, it's cash. Then two is expending the acquisition related costs. All right, since the parent company acquired all of the shares of subsidiary, clearly there is control because we just need the minimum of 51% to achieve control. All right, no goodwill or gain on acquisition or income from acquisition is recorded by the acquirer. Then after the acquisition, S company will not be dissolved. Of course, we know that. And there is now a relationship established between parent and subsidiary. I think that is clear already. The parent is the acquirer, the company or entity that transfers consideration, while the subsidiary is the recipient of the consideration or the party that receives consideration from the former. If we acquire 100% shares of the acquiry or subsidiary, meaning there is no non-controlling interest because the controlling interest is entirely 100%. I think that's also a lesson here that one should remember. Now, where will we see goodwill or gain on acquisition? We will be seeing them in consolidated financial statement. So that will be on the next chapter. We will not be seeing them here for acquisition of stocks, but we may compute, of course, but they are not recorded in the books of either the parent and the subsidiary. They just need to be disclosed in the notes to financial statements, and we will be seeing them on the consolidated financial statements only, not on the separate individual financial statements. I hope that is clear. Again, for acquisition of stocks. For acquisition of net assets, of course, we will be seeing that in the books of the acquirer. Acquiry 
for the meantime, but it will be closed anyway and the acquiry will be dissolved. So overall, it will be on the part of the parent or acquirer. Okay, then investment in subsidiary, guys, is a long-term investment. When we put investment, normally our mindset is long-term, so more than one year and it is there to stay unless we stop our investment in a company then it is found under non-current assets. However, such presentation is permitted only if consolidation were not required, that is, when control does not exist. Okay, so in other words, the investment in subsidiary account would appear in the books of the parent as long-term investment. However, such presentation is permitted only if consolidation were not required. So if there's no control that exists, then the investment in subsidiary would appear. Then assuming consolidated financial statements are required when control does exist, then we are going to combine the two statements as a whole. And that's why we are going to be closing the investment and subsidiary account so that we will be combining the two entities. So what's the lesson here? In other words, this particular entry would really be going to the books of the parent if ever no combination of financial statements would be required. So meaning it will stay there as it is. But if there is really consolidation, aside from it will be staying on the separate, in the consolidated financial statements, it will be closed. For the first one, it will stay there on the separate but not on the consolidation because it is not required anyway. I hope that this is the clearing part here. Finally, I repeat, for the first one, investment in subsidiary would stay as well as the second one. But for the first one, since consolidation is not required, so of course it wouldn't be a part of it. So no additional consideration would be thought. But for the second one, we will know that it will be closed so that the assets and liabilities of the parent and subsidiary would be combined accordingly. And thus, goodwill and gain and acquisition would be recognized only in the consolidated financial statements, not on the separate or individual financial statements. Okay, so I said that exhaustively. Next, impairment. For impairment of assets, we said that this is only going to be applicable to assets that are non-current and the assets that are not reflected at fair values. Take note, fair values. So even if the PPE items, property, plant, and equipment items are presented at revalued amounts, it doesn't automatically mean that they are already excluded from impairment of assets because we all know that the fair value less cost to sell is not fair value. It's different. All right. So what non-current assets could be exempted to impairment? Well, if we have financial assets at fair value through other comprehensive income, clearly that's at fair value. Or biological assets at fair value, they are not impaired because they are already at fair value. The purpose of impairment is to update the values of the non-current assets to be close to their recoverable amounts estimated. So impairment, this is discussed exhaustively in your intermediate financial accounting and reporting part two, but clearly impairment happens when the value that we estimate that we can obtain from the non-current asset is lesser than its amount presented in the financial statements or on the FSS at carrying amount which is the difference between the cost less accumulated depreciation or depletion if this is a wasting asset. Or let's say the accumulated amortization if this is an intangible asset. 
Okay, that's the carrying amount. Recoverable amount is the difference, of course, or let's say the higher of fair value less cost to sell, less the value in use. Less cost to sell is estimated cost to dispose the asset. Value in use is the projected cash flows or net cash flows using an applicable discount rate. So discounting here is very important, but that is not to be done here, but this is just for the case of review. Fair value is the value by which two knowledgeable willing parties, no coercion, no intimidation, no pushing the person to buy or sell and or, then the amount achieved by them is fair value. Value in use, I explained that cash generating unit is the smallest group of assets identifiable that can generate cash inflows from continuing use independently from other assets or group of assets. So this can be a department, this can be a subunit of a department or just part of a department, or let's say any group of or class of assets. Now, for good, we all know that impairment for intangible assets is applicable only for those assets that are having limited useful lives. So just like PPA with limited useful lives, except land, land has unlimited useful life because its value would increase over time. And that is the reason that it is not also impaired. But the other PPA items, they are to be impaired because they are depreciable. Same as intangible assets, for intangible assets, we can group them into assets that are amortizable and non-amortizable. When are they amortizable? If they have definite useful lives. And knowing that goodwill is an intangible asset, but it is non-identifiable. Aside from that, it's not clear as to the useful life. So that's why it is not amortized, but it is tested for impairment annually. So since it is not an identifiable asset, so it will be part or it will be formed part of the cash generating unit to which it belongs to where there is goodwill that we can compute. Again, it can be a department, a segment, a division of a particular organization. So the cash generating unit to which goodwill has been allocated shall also be tested for impairment at least annually. And then we compare the carrying amount of the unit with the recoverable amount of the unit, including the goodwill, by the way, on the carrying amount. So, here we can have an example. What if we have the estimated recoverable amount, that's mouthful recoverable, and then based on projected cash flows value in use, probably the value in use here is higher than the fair valueless cost to sell. As a review, again, the recoverable amount is higher with a two. Then that's 650,000, the carrying amount including goodwill, of course, is at 680000 Therefore, there is an impairment loss to be recognized. So the formula to compute impairment loss is 650000 the recoverable amount RA less the CA, and the result is negative. So if it's negative, it's a loss, which is easier for us to understand or recall or think about, as opposed to reversing, because some books will be using CA minus RA. So if positive, that's loss, which is for me easier to think. I don't know with you guys if ever we use the reverse, RA minus CA. And if the result is negative, that's a loss. But what if the result is positive, meaning the recoverable amount is greater than the carrying amount? So in that case, ignore. So meaning whatever's the carrying amount, continue using it or using that. Okay. If the recoverable amount exceeds the carrying amount, there is no impairment. So that's what I said. Then if there is really impairment, impairment loss is to be recognized. Here, 650 minus 690, it's changed, right? It's 40,000. 
so that the impairment loss for goodwill is at 40,000. You can notice that we credit it immediately to the intangible asset because under intangible assets, we use direct write-off method, wherein we do not use a contra asset account as opposed to PPE, which we used accumulated depreciation. For wasting assets or mineral resources, we used accumulated depletion. But for intangible assets, we do not make use of any contra asset account. So we just use goodwill. Again, direct write-off method. Disclosures. For disclosures, we do not need to memorize them, but always the clue here in disclosure is that what items that would enhance the readability of our financial statements and would give more information to the users. Anyway, in practice, there will be lists of these disclosure requirements that can be obtained and we can get that even from SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. Then these are the extensive disclosure requirements, but let's just pick, for example, the names and descriptions of the combining entities. So example, if this is acquisition of stocks, what are these companies or entities? Now, by the way, guys, for example, for business combinations like mergers, these happened in the Philippine setting for banks. So we have like equitable PCI bank acquired by Banco de Oro Bank or Corporation. So that's BDO. And do we still see equitable PCI bank now? No, we just see BDO because BDO is the acquirer, the surviving company that assumed all of the equitable PCI bank, including, of course, assets and liabilities assumed. Another one is PNB and Allied Bank. So Allied Bank is acquired by PNB. And that's why Philippine National Bank is the one that we are seeing now. All right. So even with banks, this happened. Again, synergy is the key here for business combinations. Then method of accounting. So that's acquisition method under IFRS 3 revised. Prior to that, there was mention of purchase method, but acquisition method is to be used. Effective date, so this is the control date. The cost, all other consideration. Operations to be disposed of. So what particular acquired companies that will not exist anymore? Percentage of voting share. So basically those items which are really needed for us to be able to analyze the financial statement better. So goodwill, goodwill impairment charge, reconciliation of the goodwill between opening and closing amount. So example, within the measurement period from the time of the control date that has been established up to the end of the one year. Then summary of fair values of assets and liabilities, disclosures of cash equivalents should be separate. Then provisions for terminating or reducing activities of acquire we. So if we stop the activities of acquiring, what would be the provisions? If we reduce, what would be the provisions? For sure, there will be transitional provisions, right? So any adjustments to be made prior for the termination to happen. Then effects of the acquisition on the statement of financial position and on the operations, so performance since acquisition. More details for income from acquisition. So the reasons why the fair value of the net identifiable assets acquired is higher than the acquisition price. If goodwill, that's the second part, the reverse happened. So why is there goodwill? We need to know more details. Then, annual impairment test. So what are our key assumptions? After that, evaluation of the nature and or financial effect of business combinations occurred during the reporting period. So what happened within the measurement period or even beyond it? Then, changes in the carrying amount of goodwill. So those are 
some of the key details and disclosure requirements that we can have under IFRS 3, if not all of them. Because the list here is extensive, so meaning it's all of them as required by the standards. All right. So hopefully you've learned something for this session for business combinations. And I'll see you next time for another discussion involving more of them. And I'll see you next time. Bye.